just like makes no sense from a portfolio construction standpoint why you wouldn't hold an asset that is so clearly diversifying has obvious fundamental properties that are uh different from the rest of your portfolio and has had a pretty good return to boot welcome to the gold exchange podcast where we untangle market and policy complexity using timeless economic principles for show notes and archives go to goldexchangepodcast.com. Now, on to today's episode. Welcome back to the Gold Exchange Podcast. My name is Benjamin Vern Nadelstein. I'm joined, as always, with founder and CEO of Monetary Metals, Keith Wiener, and our special guest today, Bob Elliott. Bob is the co-founder, CEO, and CIO at Unlimited Funds. Bob, how are you doing today? Good, good. Thanks for, for having me. Bob, super excited to have you. Could you please just quickly share your background for anyone who might not know you or not follow your just awesome, awesome Twitter account? Well, thank you. I appreciate that. My uh, my career has really been uh, almost 20 years as a systematic investor. Uh, I spent almost 15 years uh, at Bridgewater Associates, which is the world's largest hedge fund, developing systematic investment strategies from a global macro perspective um, across all the major uh, asset classes. Um, and then uh, after I left Bridgewater, I uh, had a quick stint running a systematic venture capital firm, uh, which used big data to uh, find uh, interesting opportunities. And then I'm back into the public markets with what I'm doing now at Unlimited, which is um, really about bringing uh, hedge fund replication approaches uh, and getting those into an ETF structure so that uh, the everyday investor has access to the same sort of sophisticated investment strategies that, uh, you know, big institutional investors have. And Bob, you did not mention something called GiveWell. I'm going to give you a little bit of time to talk about that. And maybe is there a connection between GiveWell and Unlimited if if any of the ideas have kind of swapped over? Yeah, I, I, during my time uh, at Bridgewater, I, uh, I also was involved in uh, getting uh, the charity evaluator uh, give well set up uh, its initial form as well as uh, serving as the chairman of the board uh, as it sort of became went from a group of friends uh, trying to figure out how to uh, uh, do charitable giving more effectively to you know a more institutionalized organization today it's kind of amazing uh, I think in the last year uh, it's allocated more, almost a billion dollars have gone through give well oriented or directed charitable giving, which is kind of incredible. The core idea there is, um, you know, there's a lot of evaluators for charities, although most of those evaluators uh, do it based upon how exactly the money is spent, not whether or not it works. And give well is really focused on how do you make the greatest impact uh, for every dollar that you're giving. Um, and the result is that some interventions that you might not might not come to mind as the top things on your mind, like rehydration salts or uh, malaria uh, bed nets, uh, are highly, highly cost effective, make huge impacts on people's lives uh, in a way that, you know, wouldn't necessarily be at the top of your mind. But if you're looking for the most impact per dollar spent, uh, that's really the way to do it. And so that's really, I mean, like, how does that connect to Unlimited? I mean, more generally, it just connects to this idea of across a whole bunch of different avenues, my sort of passion for how do you use quantitative decision making uh, to to make decisions better. And it's just, you know, it's as equally applicable that that philosophy is as equally applicable in investment management or hedge fund replication or charitable giving, right? They're all different uh, cases where your decision making can be improved through systematic strategies. Okay, so Bob, I want to start our first kind of big picture here talking about gold. So a lot of people obviously know monetary metals, uh, what we do with gold. But before we get to any of the kind of extra stuff, can we just talk about when did you first hear about gold as an asset? And when did you really start to take it seriously as, oh, whoa, this is not just a shiny pet rock? Uh, gold is a financial asset, I think. You know, I, I feel like it's been you know really at the foundation of any uh, investor who comes to the markets or strategic investing from a macro perspective. And the reason why that is, is gold has a unique role as a financial asset uh, in the macroeconomic system as a contra currency uh, and as, uh, you know, essentially uh, 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 a hedge to inflation, right? A hedge 
but uh, a hedge to inflation. So the way you can really think about gold from a macro perspective is gold is uh, typically non-interest bearing money. Uh, and as a result, um, you can really think about it two different ways. It's not interest bearing money that, um, that, you know, cannot be devalued in any meaningful way. And so the way that you, you think about that is um, gold often trades, spot gold often trades uh, to the high side as interest rates fall and to the low side as interest rates rise on paper money. And the reason why that is, is because, you know, as paper money gets more yield, gold looks less uh, incrementally less attractive. And as paper money gets uh, less yield, gold looks incrementally more attractive. And then the other way to think about it at, is as a contra currency, particularly uh, as a storehold of real wealth. And so as a result, many of the ways to think about it is in cases where there are meaningful uh, inflationary pressures, uh, particularly at tailed outcomes. Not really like if inflation goes from 2 to 3%, no one really cares. But as you start to get to more tailed outcomes, tailed risks, gold starts to trade very effectively as a contra currency and a reflection of elevated inflation expectations. And so, for instance, if you're in an environment where there might be a meaningful currency depreciation, um, you know, a, a, a typical emerging market, uh, a balance of payments shock. Those are areas where uh, gold can, you know, meaningfully hold a storehold of, uh, meaningly serve as a storehold of wealth against a high inflation environment or where paper currency is being depreciated. And Keith, you've been traveling all around the world now. Can you speak a little bit about how other countries view gold and, and that kind of contra currency idea? And when I saw what Bob just described um, v visually in Turkey, where, um, you know, I've been told by, by somebody who I think knows and I trust that every person who has any degree of savings in Turkey would have at least 10 grams of gold and that the average person would have a lot more than that. I had a chance to go to the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul. And, um, you know, everywhere you go, there's gold shop after gold shop after gold shop. And I'm told that there are fewer spice merchants and fewer carpet vendors and fewer this and that. And the other thing, and more and more gold, uh, you know, shops there. Uh, in India, which I visited, they're completely gaga for gold, as you can imagine. Something just blew up on Twitter, at least to my awareness yesterday, that um, there's a huge premium in uh, Shanghai for gold, which is now, and, and so you have to take these numbers with a grain of salt because people overstate them. Like in um, April of 2020, People were saying that the uh, the spread between London and New York was over $100. We have the sub-millisecond resolution data that we correct for the clock skew so we can prove at exact moments in time. The spread was more like $25, which is already, you know, the world is coming to an end, but it wasn't $100. But um, what people are saying is that the spread in Shanghai right now was, was well over $100. And um, they think this shows some sort of de-dollarization theme. Actually, what it shows is people in China are going gaga for gold to the point where they're exporting their dollars to buy the gold, which is concerning to the People's Bank of China because they, they, they're they trying to manage the decline of their currency and they want to hold on to as many dollars as possible. They don't want those dollars to be you know, sent away. Same thing in India. You know, They don't want people to buy too much gold, so they constrain it, they limit it, they tax the you know what out of it. India is a 15% tax on gold to be imported. So the price of gold in India is effectively 15% higher. Um, so in these places, people are buying gold because it's obvious why you don't want to hold the Indian rupee. It's obvious why you don't want to hold the Turkish lira. It's obvious, perhaps not on FinTwit, but it's obvious in China why you don't want to hold the Chinese yuan. Um, and, and gold is the I mean, they buy dollars, absolutely. Everybody who can get their hands on dollars gets their hands on dollars, but they buy gold um, as well. And um, what's intuitively obvious to them is as much less obvious if you're sitting here. You know, we Americans live in the most incredible bubble of our own making, and we like it that way. Damn it, we like it. And um, in, any, in any suggestion that maybe this is a, a bubble that we're contained in, you know, you can see the cognitive dissonance, uh, you know, going on. But um, yeah, in the rest of the world, they take gold very seriously and um, uh, and very differently than we do here.
Yeah, Bob, you, you wrote that a, very few advisory firms recommend holding gold, despite obviously empirical evidence that it works, anecdotal evidence that it works, and just kind of the global demand for gold outside of the U.S. Why do you think that is? And, and what do you think about what Keith said about this kind of global uh, understanding of gold that Americans lack in our bubble? Well, I, I think most advisors have built their portfolios and most and not just advisors, but like, you know, the everyday investor have built portfolios based upon the sort of core concept that we're going to be in perpetual disinflationary dynamics, uh, you know, high growth disinflationary dynamics uh, in the U.S. context, you know, basically a repeat of what we've seen over the last 30 or 40 years, which was really beneficial to stocks and bonds. Um, but, you know, those sorts of dynamics are unlikely to persist certainly forever. And if anything, you know, 2022 was a bit of a wake up call that they may not persist, you know, they may shift faster than many people expect. And I think, it, you know, it's it's interesting that you see so many uh, professional investors sort of um, think of gold as, you know, uh, 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 the sort of asset that, you know, only real oddballs invest in. When I think actually, if you went back and you talked to people who traded markets in the 70s, like gold is like a vi highly viable, you know, front of mind asset. It continues to be a highly front of mind asset today. Um, and it's not just, you know, the need for such a transition uh, between, uh, uh, you know, a secular disinflation to a higher uh, environment of inflation. Like gold has actually, like gold actually does well also in um disinflation significant disinflationary environments and that's because the central bank needs to provide a lot basically needs to print a lot of money <laughs> um and as a result you see uh you see gold typically outperform in paper currency in those environments as well which is super applicable to what's been happening in the US uh you know over the course of the last 15 years and so you know very few people if you if you quiz an advisor you ask them how has gold performed like since the financial crisis Basically, they'll look at you, their eyes will glaze over and they'll say, ah, it must be terrible. Right. And the answer is like, no, actually, gold has like done a lot better than bonds since uh, since the financial crisis. You know, and gold has been competitive in terms of returns with equities over the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, but, you know, people aren't thinking about that. And that just like makes no sense from a portfolio construction standpoint, why you wouldn't hold an asset that is so clearly diversifying, has obvious fundamental properties that are uh, different from the rest of your portfolio and has had a pretty good return to boot. And if, if I can just interject one thing, the elephant in the room, is that if the client buys gold, then they were withdrawing from the managed account and the advisor is not getting a, uh, a fee on whatever gold that, that the client holds outside uh, the system. And so there's a, there's a perverse incentive there as well. Yeah, I mean, I think advisors have tools at their disposal, like relatively efficient tools like ETFs that, you know, they could they can buy gold, they can buy the IAU ETF and it's, um, you know, efficient and you know that with a click of a button like there's no reason why they can't have exposure why they can't easily get exposure to gold for their clientele i i think frankly it's just you know it's it's uh it's outside of the core uh domain of what people have learned in terms of how to think about asset allocations in a way that that doesn't make sense i always like to bring up this fact if you look back over the last uh, 75 years in the U.S. and you see us and you basically look at every period over 12 month period where stocks have fallen. What you find is actually gold outperforms bonds more often than not. Right. And that's a pretty that's a pretty compelling portfolio construction point, which is like this asset outperforms bond. Bonds are considered the diversifier to stocks. Right, so but bonds gold out the counterweight. Right, 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 right. Right. But gold outperforms bonds more than 50% of the time. And yet you basically hold all your risk in bonds and none of your risk in gold. It, it just makes no sense. Why would you, why would you operate a portfolio that way? We did a, um, a white paper looking at uh, the case for gold and gold yields in a portfolio, but uh, all the major, you know, wealth management groups at all major banks over the decades have done, kind of done this research and we just replicated it, which is what happens if you take a standard 60, 40 portfolio, 60 equities, 40 bonds, and put 4% gold into it. And what you get is 
less volatility, smaller drawdowns, better sharp ratio. And um, so from that perspective, an institutional money manager or a professional you know, advisor is kind of um, neglectful, I'll just, I'll just say that without casting any aspersions, to just completely ignore it. I mean, the math is what it is. It's, it doesn't require a, a sell, you know, gold doesn't have a sales proposition. You know, there's no gold ink that's selling it per se. Anyone can look at it, right? And um, the fact that they're not, uh, you know, doing it, there's some sort of ideological blinders on. Right, right. No, I, I was, I was actually, I was at Future Proof, which is a uh, this week, which is a big uh, wealth management conference, uh, biggest wealth advisor wealth management conference of the year, and you know, I whenever I talk to advisors, I basically start off and I basically say there's three, there's three ways that you can improve the sharp ratio of your portfolios: gold, commodities, and diversified alpha strategies. Those are the three ways that you can do it. And I was sitting there thinking, like, look, we've got th- literally three thousand people are at this conference. And there's literally not one person, right, in that conference who is advocating that advisors, professionally advocating that advisors add gold to their portfolio. And why is that? Well, there's no, who who benefits, right? Who Who's selling the product? I mean, like iShares has an index product, essentially, right? Like there are some products out there, but there's no one who is walking into an advisor's office and saying, you know, instead of that, like, 38th dividend fund, dividend weighted fund that you've seen this week. How about you invest in the, you know, the one thing that is meaningfully diversifying to your portfolio, right? No one's doing that. It's, I always find it funny whenever I'm talking about, you know, go buy gold ETFs or find ways to get gold in your portfolio. And people look at me like, are you getting paid for this? And I'm like, no, I'm not. Con- Nobody gets paid for it. That's the problem. Right? <laughs> Nobody gets paid to, to pitch gold in a portfolio, right? right. Well, I love looking at gold too, kind of like Keith, you were saying, if you just looked at three different variables and you took away the names, it didn't say stocks, it didn't say bonds, it didn't say gold on them, it just said X, Y, and Z. And you said, hey, uh, you are you have a financial uh, obligation or a duty to get me the best returns with the mix of these assets. Uh, but they didn't know what those assets were. Guaranteed gold is going to be in there. I mean, they're going to just do a couple of math problems and go, well, if we add a little more Z and a little less Y. And, and when you put the labels back on, that's when people's blinders kind of come back in. And so, okay, I want to ask something now. So Keith, uh, Bob started off, he said, okay, maybe a good way to think about gold is it's a tail risk against inflation. And then of course, non-interest bearing assets. So Keith, I'm going to give you a second. We're going to beat up on Bob in public. Um, So tell us quickly, okay, I'm a private person. I've heard from um, huge, huge people like Warren Buffett that gold has no yield. So quickly explain the little logo behind me and how someone could earn interest on their gold. Well, I'm uh, sort of happy to take that softball, but at the same time, don't want to overly promote, you know, monetary metals on the podcast. But yeah, we pay interest on gold. And if you look at that research about what gold does in a portfolio with no yield, the scenario becomes significantly sweeter if you impute a three percent interest rate to the gold versus uh, either no 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 return or cost to carry. Um, you know, it becomes sweeter. And um, so, yes, with respect, Mr. Buffett, you were correct when you said what you said, but uh, no longer it's now um, it's now a yielding asset. It can be, you can you can deploy it to get a return. Anyways, I don't want to overly promote, you know, monetary metals here, but. Right, and Keith, so the, the way that monetary metals, one option is to earn interest through gold leasing. And so Bob asked me, whoa, 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 I've heard of gold leasing before. Isn't that something that governments do? So Keith, you you probably be the expert. What is the difference between a private, true gold lease like Monetary Metals has and a government gold lease, which we think we've heard of before? Now that's an interesting question, and um, unfortunately, there are certain words that are overloaded that um, you know can have more than one meaning, and it always is it isn't clear that the word has more than one meaning. And even when people realize that, it isn't necessarily clear when the meaning is switching from one context to another. So what the you know central bank world and the big bullion banks often use the word leasing, you know, they don't want to acknowledge gold as any kind of money or monetary asset. So th- there's a, there's a kind of a political, at least they call it political correctness. But for now it's called woke. Um, back when I was in university that um, 
you know, people dance around and, and invent the most elaborate, you know, language. I remember significant other when that term came into use. And then you can't even say pet anymore. Now it's a domesticated canine friend. And on and on and on with these words to, you know, sort of obscure what it really is. Okay, I've got a dog and he's on a leash and we're walking the dog and he's going to lift his leg and, you know, water the bushes, right? No, it's a domesticated canine friend and we're going on a uh, uh, adventure or whatever the, I don't remember what the term was for that. Um, so they say the word lease because they want to treat it. So gold is regulated under US law as tangible property, not as money. And so we're leasing it. But what the central banks were doing, um, and I don't think largely anymore, but so this is historically, let's say in the 1990s, there was a big contango. Uh, you know, the forward curve was very steep in those days. So, uh, you know, if you, um, sold it forward, there was a big return to be had. And then as you, as it came to maturity, you'd buy back that contract and sell it again. And you were pocketing, you know, it, it could be, you know, seven, eight, 10% a year back in those days doing that. Um, and so, you know, they're getting a return on their gold, which they regard as a dry or dead asset. This is a financial play. Uh, it's a financial arbitrage. And whatever else one could say about it, it's kind of an unsavory, uh, you know, you know, sort sort of thing. Let alone its effect on the price. Um, you, you know, it's it's not it's not a good or healthy or happy thing. That this is a byproduct of the fiat currency system and and how uh, you know you know the gold market works under fiat currency. What we're doing is quite different. That there are companies that are obliged to have physical gold as inventory or work in progress. A picture of a refiner. Every day they're buying raw gold and broken jewelry, and then it gets melted and dissolved in the reactors and all that. And then they're selling, you know, finished uh, investment grade bars on the other end of the refinery. But there's always a certain amount of work in progress or a jewelry manufacturer or, um, you know, uh, a jewelry uh, a retailer for that matter. Um, these are businesses that have gold there. And so what we're doing is leasing them that inventory so they don't have the price exposure. They have the capital that they need to finance it but they don't have the price exposure. And unfortunately the same word lease is used in both contexts and the unsavory connotations of the former, uh, you, you know, there's a risk that it rubs off on the latter, but they're two very different, uh, very different things. So Bob, I wanna ask you a couple of questions now about central banks, what's going on with the economy. So when the Fed, the US central bank first raised interest rates, most people said, no chance this is gonna stick. We're not raising rates and not for long. And they kept raising and kept raising and kept raising. And now we're at 5% or maybe even more interest rates. And most people would have said, okay, if the Fed raises rates to 5%, you might as well just light the economy on fire because there's no way that puppy is going to survive. And yet, when you look, unemployment re remains low, inflation kind of falling, going back to you know where central banks want inflation to be. Uh, most people would have not predicted this. They would have said there's going to be massive losses. So Bob, first, did you predict that there was going to be kind of a blow up event? And if so, how did we kind of get to where we are now? Well, I think um, if we go back uh, almost exactly a year ago, there were a number of different sort of classic models uh, that suggested that there was, um, I believe the words were 100% probability of recession uh, to occur uh, over the subsequent 12 months. Um, and I think, you know, a small subset of us, myself included, looked at the economy, looked and understood the fundamental dynamics of the economy and said, this cycle, this cycle will likely end in a recession environment. And that is probably likely what is necessary to bring inflation durably back to the Fed's mandate. But it's going to take a lot longer than most people expect. And the reason why that is, a, it's a very important reason, is that the U.S. economy really was fundamentally restructured both following the global financial crisis to reduce leverage in the economy, which reduced its sensitivity to shifts in short end rates. And then on top of it, the period of very, very low interest rates for a very long time uh, and the money creation that came with it meant that basically all households who were borrowers were able to lock in, you know, two or three percent yields for 30 years. And nearly every corporate was able to do the same. And so uh, the reality is like the Fed is moving the short rate, which we're which we're all familiar with. But if you're a house, if you're if you're a homeowner right now, right, and you're living in your house and paying your mortgage 
The interest rates could be 10%. They could be 20%. doesn't make any difference to that mortgage payment. And so that reduced the lever that the, uh, that, that meant that the short-term interest rate impact is, was going to be a lot less than many people expected. Now, that's not to say that there'll never be a recession or that the Fed's tightening of monetary policy won't have any effect. It certainly has had some moderate effect in terms of slowing down the economy and incremental credit borrowing, right? Because incremental credit borrowing is at a higher rate than what the past credit borrowing was. But those sorts of dynamics, they take time to flow through. People have to basically spend down their their elevated cash piles. They have businesses have that are loss making have to spend down their savings. Eventually, they then become borrowers and eventually that interest rate is too high and eventually it curtails activity increases defaults. But that's the sort of thing that what we're seeing is 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 playing out over the course of, you know, a few years, not, you know, 6 or 9 months. So Keith I think that does kind of jive with your R and I theory, which is that, hey, you know, not everyone is immediately affected. You got to think on the margin. When does that first person, you know, go to borrow and go, oh, geez, 8%. That doesn't look so friendly. Um, So do do you kind of agree with Bob that, hey, you know, we we are seeing this play out. It's just a slow motion crash instead of, a okay, we click the button 5% and therefore. Yeah, I mean, I think you could probably write a whole book on, um, was it Milton Friedman who said that uh, there's variable... You said leads and lags. I'm not sure if it's leads, but they're certainly lags and very long and variable. You could write a whole book on the various different lags that uh, that occur. One of which, which I've talked about a little bit, I think, is um, employers. There's been so many little head fakes of of you know either threats of rate hikes or threats of recession, and that employers, you know, over the last 15 years or so, have uh, been quick to, in some cases, too quick to to do layoffs. And, you know, because if you're going to have a downturn or recession, the key is a big employer is to pare down all your costs early, then go all the way down to the bottom with your cost trim. And then as soon as there's a sign of a turn, then aggressively ramp and steal market share from the other guys that are still smarting or their their uh, the economy got inside their decision loop. They're first trimming their expenses at the bottom, which is when you should be expanding. And every time an employer did this over the last uh, what you know, 14 years, they've been burned. The Fed has absolutely trained Pavlov's dogs that when you think there's a recession, there isn't going to be, if you do a layoff, you're going to regret it. You're going to be going back to the people you just laid off and offering them huge bonuses and big raises to come right back on. And so this time around, I think employers have been much more reluctant to do any kind of layoffs um, or they'll, they'll, they'll do attrition. So when people age out and retire, maybe they're replacing at a slower rate but, um, you know, so I think that's one factor. Another that has just been puzzling me, I don't think I've written a lot about this. Why is the spread between junk bonds and treasuries not blowing out a lot more? It hasn't really blown out at all. In fact, it's very, uh, very tight. And um, I, I've just felt there has to be some perverse mechanism behind the scenes. Um, so for instance, after Silicon Valley Bank, when the Fed became highly conscious of the uh, incredible losses on a mark-to-market basis the banks were all sitting on those treasuries they may have bought in 2020 when the 10-year treasury was at 0.65% interest rate. And now here we are at 4.2. That represents what a 25% loss in, in principal value, something like that on that bond. Um, so what has the Fed done? Is they said, we'll take these bonds on repo now, it's full recourse, if the Fed says, but of course, that has no teeth to it. It's only one year limit, which, of course, has no teeth to it. Um, and the banks are paying a, a quote unquote punitive interest rate. We'll see how long that lasts. But effectively, the banks are pawning off the bonds to the Fed as if they're still at a 0.65% interest rate. And so this is a way of delaying. Uh, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the Fed would argue if they were confronted with this, they're trying to engineer a soft landing. Maybe that's the term they would use but they're delaying the onset of the higher interest rates by cushioning the banks and not, the banks don't really have to suffer the capital loss. Anytime this comes up, if the bank has a redemption, they just point it off to the Fed. But in terms of the junk bonds, this doesn't explain junk bonds. And I've just been puzzling and puzzling about this. Um, I got a call last night from a buddy who is a, you know, kind of a private uh, financial advisor and sells a lot of annuities and sort of clever insurance product 
uh, insurance structures uh, for tax planning purposes and other things to his clients. He had a call with one of the um, insurance companies that provides these products and that uh, and somebody, you know, fairly high placed on the back office end, not the sales end. And they were saying that um, they are right now getting, so they, they have the regulators are all over their balance sheet, looking at every kind of asset they have and every asset has a rating. And based on the rating, I mean, obviously the, the public markets, usually there's a, there's a credit rating from one of the recognized ratings agencies and the private stuff, the regulators will give it ratings. And based on the rating, um, that's that determines how much capital haircut they have to take to hold that asset. So if you're buying, you know, treasuries, there's no there's no haircut. And if you're buying junk bonds, and normally there's a very big haircut. Well, they're getting essentially ratings credits right now for owning junk. This is what came out of this conversation. And he said, Keith, this goes to what you're saying. You're so puzzled as to why. Junk bonds haven't blown out. Yes, yeah, because the regulators have given a perverse incentive to institutional investors to hold them and say, yeah, well, you don't have to take a haircut or not as much of a haircut for owning them. And you get a better return. It can recapitalize your balance sheet, you know, by getting that higher return and sitting there. And so the Fed, on the one hand, is take a thing away by, by raising interest rates. But on the other hand, the Fed plus the other regulators are give a thing to uh, to try to mitigate. So do we have higher interest rates or do we not? Well, if you're a bank and you have all these, you know, long-term treasury bonds on your balance sheet, effectively, not really. Every new bond you buy has a higher interest rate, but the old ones can be pawned off at the lower interest rate that you need. And therefore, um, you're mitigating all this. So I think we would have had a harder landing earlier if they weren't playing all these games. Uh, than than we actually do. That said, I don't think the games ultimately, you know, fix anything. They just postpone it, and the problem grows in magnitude while it while it delays. I don't know if that answers the question, but those are my that's my stream of consciousness of this this morning. Well, Keith, I know I know that we are obviously no big fans of central planning to say the least. Um, but in a way, isn't this kind of an interesting argument, right? Like one big fat number, five percent, right? That is for every borrower, every institution, every business, wow, they have to deal with 5%. And clearly that affects zombie companies and private lending and all these different things, all the same, if they all just have to touch this one financial gravity number at 5%. But what you're kind of noting is that, well, these other kind of regulators and you know central planning apparatchiks can come in and say, oh, well, don't worry about the 5% yourself. You know, we, We'll make it a, more like three or four for you, right? And that obviously has different effects on the economy than if everyone was dealing with that 5% number. So, Bob, do you see that that kind of difference in interest rates and, of course, the risks involved there uh, in the economy, or, or do you see it a bit differently? Well, I think from uh, looking at it from a macro perspective, uh, and I find it interesting, like the regulator loosening uh, under the hood is uh, that Keith was talking about is... Um, consistent with some other things, some other uh, anecdotal evidence or anecdotal uh, dynamics I, I've gotten about it as well. But I think when I'm looking at it, I'm more looking at it from a top down macro perspective. And if you think if you just like take a step back in terms of where we are in this overall tightening process, like the US economy is running too hot, inflation is too elevated, it's above the Fed's mandate, it's not on a clear path to fall to the Fed's mandate. Um, and the Fed has actually like made a pretty good amount of progress on changing the price of credit, right? The price of credit, meaning how much does the incremental borrower have to pay to borrow? The answer is like a lot, you know, like if you get a mortgage, you know, you print a mortgage today, it's almost 8%. If you go get an auto loan, you're paying 8%. You know, if you're, uh, you know, I don't know, even a company issuing a newly minted, you know, syndicated loan, you're looking at, you know, 10%, 12%. That's very high and that is hard. Um, but the problem is that asset prices haven't come down. And that's a really important thing to think about, which is um, when I look at high yield bonds and I look at those prices, and, and particularly if I look at the spread return, right, not just the treasury component, but the spread, I look at that and I say, well, that's basically at highs, right? That's basically, you know, because you're getting the yield on the spread and the prices haven't, you know, the spreads haven't widened that much. In fact, they're kind of normal. 
same thing is true in equities, right? Which is that stocks, you know, stocks right now, um, you know, basically at all time highs, they're not far off of all time highs, you know, and typically in a recession, what you see is stocks fall like 20, 30, 40%, right? Like that's, that's, that's when stocks move, right? Not, you know, 5% off the highs. And so if you think about the old, and, and I should also mention that houses for the, for the everyday, you know, the everyday person who owns their home are still up like 40% relative to pre COVID, you know? So, okay, put that all together and the balance sheet of households of investors is basically as strong as it ever has ever been. And that is creating a circumstance where they're not being pressured to curtail their spending because asset prices are rising. And so they can continue to dissave. Or if you want to go buy buy something, I mean, the reality is how, how, are, how are house prices so elevated at a time when mortgage rates you know, would imply that you have to pay twice as much for, you know, a monthly payment than you did two or three years ago. And the answer is what well, people just pay cash, right? It's not that complicated. Like if I have a bunch of equity wealth that has been built up through these elevated equity levels, I just sell the equities, I pay for cash in the house and boom, there you go. I've got, you know, I can pay the higher cost of, of things. And so I think that's when you sort of put the whole macro dynamic together like the Fed has solved the price of credit problem, but it hasn't solved the asset price problem. And that until they solve the asset price problem or get solved on its own uh, through market conditions, which is probably the more likely path right now, we're not going to have a meaningful slowing of the economy and the Fed will not get the economy back to where it needs to go consistent with its mandate. There's another thought that's been developing in my head in, in the last uh, you know couple of weeks, which is you know, we have this epic yield curve inversion where um you know the interest rate on 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 long bonds has gone up but not as much as as what the fed has forced for for the overnight rate or even one month or, or one year rate and um you know the ultimate and long and long duration asset would be a home or a stock which is both are arguably per, 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 perpetuities and so if if you have an inverted yield curve the perpetuity would have an even lower effective interest rate or in real estate, a lower cap rate than um, let's say the 10 year treasury or the 30 year treasury. And so what we're seeing is reflection of the same thing. The interest rate on really long perpetuities is even lower and therefore um, the asset prices is higher. And how does that get resolved? I'm, 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 I'm not necessarily of the firm conclusion that it doesn't get resolved that the Fed is just basically stuck with an inverted yield curve until the Fed is going to be forced to back away and they can't invert it anymore, hold it, hold the inversion anymore, rather than that the prices of assets necessarily has to come down and that the yield curve has to flip to normal the other way. I'm 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 sort of of two minds of this right now. And so you're catching me right in the in the thought process of this. But it makes sense from an inverted yield curve perspective that real estate and uh, and equity should have effectively low rates, which means high asset prices. That at least that's consistent with what we see in the, in the treasury yield curve. Bob, please help my friend Keith out. Let's let's talk uh, let's talk it out here. What, what do you think? Well, I, I I think what that yield curve you know the yield curve um, can mean a bunch of different things. Um, you know, one thing that it can mean is that. There are times when you have an inverted yield curve where people are expecting meaningful easing of monetary policy because it's just the future. You know, the, the yield curve and forward interest rates are just the future path of expected monetary policy in like a mechanical sense. I don't think that's the case here. I think what we have is um, is what's what's often described as a as a negative term premium, which means that trade off between holding cash and holding duration, longer duration assets. Um, is such that you're likely receiving a meaningful negative carry by holding long duration bonds in particular. Um, and that is very unusual because if you think about how the world works, long duration bonds have risk, cash has no price risk, right? I mean, it might get inflated away or something like that, but but it has no price risk. Bonds have price risk. And so you should see typically a positive uh, yield premium that exists. And so I think getting into the nuts and bolts, um, like how could that possibly be happening? You know, of course, part of it is that 
at various times, there's been some expectations of some Fed cutting, but I don't think that's the main dynamic that's going on here, particularly as you sort of look at twos versus tens. What's been going on is that for a variety of different idiosyncratic reasons, supply of long dated borrowing has been very depressed uh, over the course of the last nine months. Uh, that's been through a combination of the fact that the federal government has not had to borrow, both because they weren't legally allowed to borrow uh, during the debt ceiling problem, and then they switched to mostly issuing bills right after the debt ceiling. And on a forward-looking basis, particularly starting in the fourth quarter, we're likely to see significant increases in duration supply from the government. Now, usually the government um, is a counter-cyclical uh, actor in the in the economy, and so wouldn't you know, their pickup and issuance would happen when there's a collapse in demand to borrow. And so it would be an offsetting pressure. But in this circumstance, it's actually interestingly aligning with a pickup in others' interest in borrowing. And the reason why that is, is because basically lots of borrowers, as interest rates rose, you know, they had locked in some financing and had chosen not to go to the market and issue additional bonds at higher yields. But, you know, that's been in place for 18 months, something like that, 18 months, two years. There's only so long you can go is the reality, right? Like these companies need to borrow, debt comes due, they need to roll over the debt, they need incremental borrowing. And so what we've seen interestingly right after Labor Day is the you know the most amount of corporate bond supply on the long end that we've seen in a long time. And so you put those things together and I think that's really an interesting dynamic, which is like, well, you know, what hap what what's really going on here is we're actually getting a pickup in duration supply, a meaningful pickup in duration supply um, at a time uh, you know, when some of the other monetary policy dynamics like inflation is not yet beat. So from a fundamental perspective, there, you know, there's still questions about bond yields. And so my guess is we're likely to see that negative term premium shift meaningfully uh, over the course of the next, you know, three, six, nine months. And that that sort of classic bear steepening driven by long end supply it's not unheard of it's un it's it's unusual but not unheard of and likely to be the dynamic we're seeing you know over the course of the next uh the next couple of months in in your opinion let's just take a hypothetical scenario the next five years what do you think is more likely that interest rates are not going to fall below five percent for the next five years or they're never actually going to meaningfully rise above 0.5 percent so are we either going to be stuck in a kind of high environment or a low environment in this kind of hypothetical scenario? And then Keith, I'll ask you the same question. Uh, well, first of all, I'd say when when you're when you're talking to a macro uh, investor, they're often thinking sort of in a three and six month time frame and have uh, the good ones have great humility. Like what's going to happen in five years? Like uh, I, I have no idea. Like my confidence in that is is very low. Um, what I would say is my guess is we're likely to see a lot more volatility than people are expecting. So, you know, basically what it's taken and we're still not there is it's taken a meaningful shift in interest rates to move to slow the economy. That path and that process is probably not yet done. And so we probably will need significantly, uh, you know, we'll probably need another, you know, meaningful amount of interest rate rise on the long end to finally slow the economy. Um, and so, you know, rates are likely to go higher than people expect right now uh, in order to get uh, the recession type dynamic to start to emerge. And then I think the thing that's interesting on the flip side is, you know, everyone is sort of talking about how it, you know, it's been so hard for the Fed to slow down the economy. As a result, we have higher interest rates without sort of thinking about, well, if it's hard for the Fed to slow the economy, it's also hard for the Fed to stimulate the economy. And so it's very likely that we will experience a much harder landing than most people expect. When I hear people say, oh, there'll just be a recession, but it'll be mild. I'll be like, I, you know, my my first thought is like, why? Why will it be mild? Why won't it be actually a lot worse? Because it's been a lot worse on the upside to slow the economy. Why won't it be harder on the downside to stimulate the economy, which would then create a situation where we may have the type of disinflation or deflationary dynamics uh, that we saw, you know, post GFC, um, you know, a lot of that, that sort of fundamental situation still remains in place. And so could create, you know, a sharp move back down for bond yield. So up and then down with more volatility than most people expect. Keith, your way, are we still in that kind of fundamental issue of central banking? They got to go hard up a little bit more and then right back down. I, I'm certainly with Bob on uh, rising volatility. Um, 
you know, there's a lot of different ways to look at this. And, and if you compare it to 2008, I think the Fed is hiking more than it did prior to that crisis. And um, I think there's more certainly debt on the economy, if not leverage. But on the other hand, I think there isn't going to be any more Bear Stearns or Lehman Brothers. I think the Fed is and the other regulators are what the term I would use would be hyper proactive. They're looking for the slightest sign of anything, which is why asset prices, you know, as, as we said, junk bonds, for instance, haven't been allowed to collapse as they should because the Fed is trying to tamp down anything that would really erupt into a crisis while at the same time trying to precipitate a landing of some sort, whether soft, hard, or, or mushy, or indifferent. Um, and, um, you know, it's one of those things where the trillion-ton rock meets the trillion-ton force, you know, which one's going to win? And I think in the end, reality reasserts itself, but that can take a long time. Um, I don't think there's demand for, you know, credit to finance productive enterprise anyway at these kind of interest rates after all these years of zero interest rate uh that pulls down the marginal return this is my r is less than i uh, r is greater than i uh you know thesis you pu push the interest rate down you pull down return on capital across the board now here we are what are all these companies going to do if they have to roll over their borrowings even at a 10-year treasury at 4.2 let alone if, if greater issuance uh, and greater supply of long-term debt, uh, um, you know, pushes the interest rate up to arguably where it should be. If you had a normal yield curve and the overnight rate is five and a half, what the hell should the 10-year be? Eight and a half or who knows what, right? And then, uh, you know, if you're a single A credit or a, a double B or something like that, you should be a 10 plus easily in that world and then junk, who knows, uh, at, you know, 15 to 20 or beyond. There's no demand for credit. I mean, nobody can service the debt at those rates, which means you just have a massive cascading default, which is what the Fed is trying. The Fed is trying to engineer higher interest rates without falling asset prices and without the defaults that come from either higher interest rates killing the zombies or um, falling asset prices and therefore killing the bank balance sheets. So the Fed is trying to juggle this contradictory uh, you know, mess and um, but they're hyper proactive and they're looking for the first sign of crisis anywhere and tamping that down. So what's ultimately going to win? I think crisis ultimately wins is that crisis within six months. I think market indicators right now are not suggesting that it's imminent. Um, and nor do I think it's imminent that the gold price is going to explode to three thousand dollars or five thousand dollars imminently. Longer term, I, I would bet against the Fed being able to manage this because the perverse incentives grow greater and greater, and therefore the perverse behaviors grow greater and greater. The macro potential regulators, that's their real job is to run around, figure out what all the perverse incentives are, figure out what the banks are doing to game the system, and then say, no, 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 you're not supposed, we were at that, not that, you know, and, um, you know, they're gonna miss a beat because they don't get it. These are sophisticated, complex systems that you know, the regulators are the last people that are gonna understand what the banks are really doing. Um, you know, I have a, a funny anecdote completely in a different area, but it just shows kind of the mentality, like the compliance mentality and how it doesn't see the bigger picture. So it's from a, um, I think a kind of a CPA firm with an eye towards labor compliance, it might've been a labor law firm, sends me this email saying that uh, some firms are reporting it's a big problem that your non-exempt employees, so these are, employees that you have to pay an hourly wage and you have to have full compliance for the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act and then whatever the state versions there are. And so uh, these employees are reading emails at night and then of course filling in their time cards, which in a lot of states, if you're working at night, uh, would automatically be time and a half at least and maybe double time depending on various parameters. And so these companies are getting upset that employees are, are doing time and a half to read email at night. And, and, you know, companies are paying for time and a half for that. So uh, they're saying, and this was the part, this is the relevant part. They're saying that, well, some managers are just saying, um, well, just tell the employees not to uh, do email at night. And, uh, you, and I'm just thinking, man, that's the typical bean counter mentality. That's a compliance mentality. Just don't do that, right? Without any awareness that that might mean that customers are now going to be left hanging and, um, you know, projects are going to be late and there's going to be consequences. 
which might be the cost of which might be far greater than whatever you're paying the hourly rate, and that there isn't necessarily the simple blanket compliance solution of no email at night. That, that things are more complicated than that. And that's the mentality of a regulator. And I'm not putting regulators down. They're in a box, they're given a set of rules, enforce the rules, and not necessarily encouraged to think broader outside the box. These are the rules, this is what you're working with. And so do they understand the economic consequences of, of bifurcating the interest rate and saying, okay, if you're a bank and you have uh, bonds on your balance sheet, we're gonna effectively make a special magical bubble just for you to live in where the interest rate is still 0.65%. But for all new credit incrementally borrowed, as Bob said, then then the interest rate is really gonna be um, you know, 7% or whatever. Um, you know, do they understand the people that are creating that perverse incentive don't understand it? They're just trying to tamp down a crisis. The macro prudential regulators to come along and see whatever perverse games the banks come up with, how they game this. Are they going to recognize it? Are they going to respond? And so you get this pressure building. When does when does the magma chamber blow? When does the caldera wipe out life in the northern hemisphere or whatever the consequences of this may be? Very hard to predict. Chaotic system. Slip stick, you know, dynamics or stick slip dynamics, um, you know, probably not in the next six months. I think that's a reasonably comfortable prediction to make. Um, but, uh, you know, this is what's going on. I think at the end of the day, the Fed is going to be forced to lower interest rates back to zero uh, and beyond. Um, but, um, uh, you know, in the meantime, uh, you know, the regime of, of rising interest rates can prevail uh, for some time longer. That, that's my take on it. The one thing I liked about economics was they said, hey, you know, uh, most people, when they walk around, they see the scene, right? Hey, look, uh, the government just built a brand new bridge. And everyone goes, wow, this is great. I mean, there's a new bridge, right? Um, but the economist is that kind of wet blanket who comes over and goes, guys, we didn't just get a bridge for free. <laughs> there's no shot that we all just got a bridge for free. And some people, yeah, yeah, taxes, I get it, I get it. But the economist's job is to say, okay, where did those uh, laborers come from? Where did those resources come from? What was the opportunity cost of doing this bridge? What were all the unseen things that were happening? And of course, the simpler the project, the simpler the unseen, right? And be like, hey, listen, you know, if uh, you talk to Ben for 20 minutes and you paid him, yes, you know, Ben got paid, but where'd the money come from? You know, what could have Ben been doing otherwise? Uh, but with things like, you know, bank term funding facilities and, you know, zombie companies and, and all these kind of really just intense dynamics, you know, the unseen can be really complicated. And like you said in the very beginning, I mean, you could write a book about the unseen implications starting, you know, the last six months. So Bob, for, for the people who are going to continue following this and are going to be looking at the unseen, what's something that we should be looking at? What's an indicator? What, what, where, where are places that we should be looking for those cracks that aren't just, okay, the banks are insolvent? Well, okay, the, the Fed can maybe deal with that, right? They're looking for the next Lehman. Where should we be looking? That's a good question. I think this... Uh... This thinking about the unseen and the complexity of the system, um, you know, uh, I'm reminded the day we're recording here is the 15th anniversary of the failure of Lehman Brothers, um, which I was uh, heading up Bridgewater's research on uh, whether the crisis was going to be a big deal or a small deal uh, back 15 years ago. Uh, fortunately, I did the work and suggested it might be a big deal. Uh, so it's on the right side of that trade. Good call. Um, <laughs> But I think, you know, I think many of us who uh, lived through that experience um, have a very, uh, a very tangible appreciation of the complexities of uh, the system and also how, uh, how, how interwoven particularly financial intermediaries are um, and how things can move very, very fast. You know, that happened in the course of days, not in the course of years. Um so anyway, so that it just kind of uh it's it's a it's a it's a day to reflect on that particular question for sure. Um and also on the failure of regulators to figure out that it was going to happen. Um when I think about on a forward looking basis, you know, the main things to be looking at here I think are um are interestingly like I think market oriented and I think the markets are going to really give us a good lens into how these dynamics are playing with each other. So in particular, um, what we're seeing, you know, with that 
that that basically that duration supply, right? Are we seeing interest rates continuing to rise? That inter- those interest rates, you know, the Fed is likely on the sidelines. They've said that they're not going to do much more. I mean, maybe they tighten once or more. Like, who cares? It doesn't really matter. The real question is, do we get enough of a long end rise to start to hit asset prices? And that intersection between essentially how stocks are performing relative to how bonds are performing, I think is going to be really important to understand the sort of financial conditions and whether we're getting um, whether we're getting a mar- enough of a market-based tightening uh, in order to create a turn in the economy, because that's really kind of what we're all looking for. And the way you'd see that is as long as, you know, bonds are selling off, but, you know, stocks are rallying or selling off less, that is an indication that we're in an environment where the tightening has not done enough to really slow, meaningfully slow down the economy or hurt asset prices enough. But as you start to see stocks move down faster than bonds, that's really a great indication to say that this is probably the dynamic where things are starting to turn. I think in that context, both of those stories are around stocks not doing well and bonds not doing well. I think it's particularly important for investors to be looking outside of traditional stocks and bonds to find other assets. I actually think, uh, again, today's market action, not to get over-focused on one day, but I think it actually is a really good indication and and it's actually reflective of what we've seen over the last six weeks or so, which is a sell-off in bonds, a sell-off in stocks. But two areas that you see that are not underperforming, gold and oil, right? The two most diversifying assets to any uh, anyone's strategic portfolio, gold and oil, uh, are continuing to rally. And that is a that is a toxic combination for those investors who are stuck on 60-40, um, but a real opportunity for those investors who can look for diversification and get into things like gold and oil uh, to be able to navigate through this environment. So I think um, we're probably going to see uh, more of days that look like today that people are unprepared for for a variety of reasons uh, than days when 6040 is going to do well. And so that's going to be a really challenging time, I think, over the next you know three or six months for most investors. Bob, second to last question here. What's a question I should be asking all future guests of the Gold Exchange podcast? Uh, how much gold do you have in your portfolio? Okay, I like the question. Good one. Okay. Just good, a simple. Yeah, that's a simple question. Uh, my answer is uh, between ten to fifteen percent at any point in time. Um, okay, and that's Bob. In your investment portfolio, right? Yeah, I mean, obviously, people hold gold for like jewelry and stuff, but your true investment allocation to gold. And of course, the secret gold that's down in the down in the basement or under the garden <laughs> somewhere. Don't tell anybody about. It. Okay, so Bob, uh, before we go. I just love your work. You're a great thinker. Uh, people have to follow you. They got to be reading your stuff. And if they want to learn more about you, unlimited funds, where can they find you? Yeah, I uh, I run a pretty active Twitter uh, on macro uh, on a, you know a a day to day in terms of what's going on and and at least what I'm seeing likely to transpire. That's at Bobby Unlimited on Twitter. Um, and then you know if you're interested in what we're doing uh, at Unlimited. Uh, related to hedge fund replication and whether those strategies might be uh, the right thing for your portfolio, definitely check out what we're doing, unlimitedetfs.com, uh, where you can find more information about our uh, our products. Bob, I want to thank you so much for coming on to the Gold Exchange Podcast. It was a blast. Hopefully nothing bad happens in the economy, but in case it does, we'll be watching your Twitter feed uh, with, with peeled eyes, and hopefully we'll see you back on the podcast. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. It was great to meet you all. Thanks so much, Bob. Great to meet you, Bob. This episode was brought to you by Monetary Metals. Monetary Metals is a different kind of gold company. Others buy and sell gold. Monetary Metals operates the Gold Yield Marketplace, a platform of products that offer a yield on gold paid in gold to investors and institutions, and are gold financing simplified, reliable financing denominated in gold with a built-in hedge for gold using and gold producing businesses. To learn more, visit www.monetary-metals.com. See you next time.